Hello and welcome to another edition of The Tigers Down Under. I'm your host as always, Alex, and with me tonight I have Logan. Good evening, Alex, and uh, everybody listening. Welcome back. Um, we've got an unfortunate game to talk about this week. Um, a 3-0 loss to Blackburn, which is our first loss in 10 games or 11 games, uh, which has been unfortunate. And it does feel as if the uh, the podcast is a little bit cursed, that we uh, made our return and drew our first game after after our return, and now we've um, lost the next one as well. So um, not, a, not a great result for the boys. I guess it was, in a way, it was coming. Um, you can't you can't kind of expect to win every single game uh, and especially with the defense that we named I think it was a concern all last week that potentially uh, device was definitely out and potentially Burke as well so um, not not the uh, not the most experienced defense I guess we could have put out and, and it really showed on the pitch yes yeah, certainly uh, I guess that it was one of those things that we always knew that the bubble was going to ver- burst at some point uh, but I guess the the manner that it, that it did burst in wasn't exactly the most disappointing thing in the sense that uh, we were missing some key players and our defence was uh, was certainly under strength. So given uh, I guess given those factors, it it, it made it uh, almost believable uh, that that we were going to lose that game. And uh, and Blackburn are a, a tough team and they're on a great run. So um, uh, yeah, certainly it, it was a tough game and uh, it, it wasn't exactly uh, unexpected. But I think that if we're if we're honest with ourselves, all all the city faithful were still very optimistic that uh, that a team like Blackburn, if we were going to continue on uh, and make this playoff run, uh, then they're the kind of team that we need to be beating. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I guess the the main concern uh, in terms of personnel was Mazuk going off injured in the first half, which pretty much I would think spells the end of his time at City. Uh, you just can't expect a player to continue to to play half a game or not even get to half time in a lot of his appearances and go off with an injury. And it sounds like this one's an Achilles injury, which might be a more serious one as well. So um, not a, not a good result for this, for the team. And I guess um, already down to senior center backs, we're going to be hopefully going to uh, bring a couple more in um, before the deadline today. Well, you would hope so. Although it seems that all the rumors seem to be continuing to link us with uh, every, every winger and front man in the division. So um, we, I guess we sit and hope that Nigel Atkins is, is able to twist the, the Alum's arm into into some kind of deal for um, for the defensive reinforcements that we so desperately require. Um, and I guess on the game itself, uh, concerning that we weren't able to get on the score sheet, um, I guess a hallmark of the fact that we were able to go on a, a decent winning run was that we were able to score every game. Um, and, you know to not get on the score sheet, to see sort of blanks from Bowen and Krzyzewski who have been in great form for us so far. Um, do you see it as sort of a one-off uh, performance perhaps or do you, do you sort of think that um, these these defensive injuries are sort of impacting on the side and, and it might kind of um, risk the side falling into a bit of a rut? I definitely do think the defensive, uh, I guess, the disadvantages that we, we've been subject to have, have had a lot to do with... Um, or did have a lot to do, rather, with that Blackburn result. Uh, Grzycki and Bowen, even when they did get the ball, uh, full credit to Blackburn, they looked like a very um, resolute defensive unit, and they scrambled extremely well. So it it wasn't necessarily a case of uh, Grzycki or Bowen uh, playing poorly, but uh, I felt it was more a case of Blackburn strangling our midfield and not having that, I guess, free-flowing passing game that we've become accustomed to in the last few weeks. So... Um, that was probably the more disappointing thing was the fact that even though they weren't in the game, it wasn't necessarily uh, through uh, unbelievably poor performances from either of them. But as you mentioned, uh, disappointing nonetheless because we have become so used to seeing them on the score sheet week in, week out. Yeah, and I guess it's quite incredible that Blackburn booked so good against us in the um, first uh, clash this season and um, they've managed to sort of have pull out that sort of performance against us again. Um, which is remarkable considering they were sitting basically level on points with us uh, and they certainly seem aside on the up and, and potentially going for a playoff place as well. Um, I guess we'll, we'll look ahead to the Stoke game in a little bit, but I guess we're going to have to hope that we can bounce back pretty quickly um, and, and, yeah, sort of start to see the players gelling and, and, and hopefully finding a solution at centre-back. I, I guess um, we sort of touched on last week the potential for Lee High to play at centre-back or... Um, it's going to be a case of looking at the the kids. You know, Mackenzie, I think Curry's out on loan and he was the other one that had looked okay at centre-back for us uh, so far this season. 
Yeah, it, it's very hard to, to make these comments, I guess, uh, t- 12 hours out from the, yeah. the closing of the transfer window. And I think that uh, with, within the next day, we'll have a, a greater picture of, uh, I guess, what our defence is going to look like. And if they're moving forward, we are going to be able to recapture the, that same form and, and have that um, resolve that we've been showing. Uh, I think the, the most disappointing thing, though, is the fact that uh, our, our defence has struggled and there was the, the rumour at the start of Connolly coming in and then that deal seemed to break down. And you just can't help that if we had either Elphick or, uh, or Connolly as the, as the backup, uh, then perhaps in the game against Villa we may have been able to scramble something and, and certainly have put in a, a stronger and uh, more, I guess, capable performance against the, the very hot Blackburn side. And if that had have been the case, then uh, the gap that is now kind of uh, manifested itself uh, between us and that that six uh, spot seems to probably be at least one two uh, one win too many um, from from my perspective now. I think. Well, we'll we'll talk about the transfer window now because that is, uh, I guess, the focus of everyone today. Um, and it, it is interesting to see that Villa are looking to bring in another couple of defensive signings. Uh, I think they're looking at getting Tyrone Mings from Bournemouth. Um, and I've seen it sort of suggested that that could open the door for Elphick to come back to us on loan. Um, I think Adkins has previously said that he's spoken to the uh, to the Villa manager and sort of confirmed that Elphick won't be coming back out on loan. But, um, you know, who knows? If, if they're able to bring in a few other players, it, it could open that door up. Um, and I'm sure we'd be quite happy to bring him back, given his impact when he was in the side. Um We've been linked to a couple of players. Ridgewell um, is probably the main centre-back that I've seen us linked to, and he, he isn't really that confidence-inspiring. He's, I think, 34 years old. Used to play at West Brom, I think, if I'm not mistaken, and, and most recently in the MLS. Um, the fact that, you know, sides aren't clamouring for his signature sort of doesn't really inspire much confidence in, in the quality. But um, from an experience point of view, having a level head in the dressing room, um, you know, stepping in, you know, playing at centre back until Device is back fit um, might not be the worst signing. I, I would presume he'd be quite cheap. Um, he's probably the one that I'd be most interested in seeing pushed through today. And you know, it always seems the case that on deadline day these play- names come out of nowhere as well. So maybe there'll be a few other players that sort of pop up as the day progresses. Um, the other one that we've been linked to a lot is Ben Woodburn from Liverpool, um, and we seem to have a pretty good experience with um, signing wingers on loan from Liverpool. Markovic in the Premier League did decently well, and then obviously Wilson last season was fantastic. Um, though that one I've seen in the last couple of hours, Alan Nixon on Twitter is sort of suggesting that's not going to happen. Um, th- those are the two names that I've seen us most closely linked to. And then going the other way, krasicki has been linked a bit to Middlesbrough, though they're also looking at a couple of other players. So um, his name always seems to float around on deadline day and then hopefully doesn't actually end up going anywhere. Um, but what, what's your take on, on A, what we need before the window closes and B, the players that we've been linked to so far? It's funny how much this question has changed in the last few weeks given the, the recent form of City when I guess the objective uh, only <laughs> uh, six to eight weeks ago was merely to stay up and then we find ourselves in, in this mid-table kind of uh, area of no man's land where you get the the question, does a couple more signings uh, entitle you the, or give you the confidence to, to really push on and, and try and make the playoffs? But um, I guess from the Alums' perspective, knowing how uh, how much they purely <laughs> don't like to invest in the squad anymore, um, which has been evident through all the loan deals, and kind of now making that decision, well, they're not going to release the funds for any real high-profile players to to have a crack at the playoffs. And also given the fact that now they're probably certain that, uh, well, without a doubt, we are we are safe, um, that there's no real impetus for us to kind of uh, kick on and, uh, and and make that run. So I just don't think that there's going to be uh, an incredible amount of urgency for, for this window, um, given the fact that we're talking between now and May. Uh, I don't think they're going to feel the need to really... Um, open the checkbook and, and, and get reinforcements in. And as a result, I'm, I'm very uh, interested to see more so about the outgoings. I think um, Grzycki is, is at one stage going to leave the club and the fact that he's still here is, is somewhat miraculous. Um, 
him and Jared Bowen are by far and away our greatest assets. And obviously the link with Tottenham uh, to Bowen is a scary one. And I do think that if not signed uh, within the next 12 hours, I think that in the summer is a very, very high likelihood he will be off. Um, and I think Riziki will um, will likely follow suit um, somewhere else. But uh, I, I think that this transfer in, in many ways is, is somewhat irrelevant in the scheme of how they're viewing it. Um, I think what the City fans want, what the coaching staff want, uh, I just don't think that it's uh, it's going to be deemed significant. And, um, yeah, I'd, I'd be surprised. I think if we could hold on to Bowen and Grzycki, even now, that that would be a successful window. Yeah, I, I think that's the case. I, look, at a minimum, if we could get one or two centre-backs in, I'd be quite content if nothing else happens. Obviously, you want to see, you know, a couple of speculative picks coming in in the attack, attacking sense, whether it's a winger, whether it's a striker. I know we've been talking about getting a replacement for Keane, which bizarrely still hasn't happened. I thought there was a whole lot of talk that we weren't going to release him until we got a replacement sorted out, which, you know, we seem to have kind of given up on. Um, but yeah, if we could just get a couple of centre-backs, I'd probably be pretty happy with, um, even if nothing else happens um, on that front. So I, I guess we'll just keep our um, eyes peeled for, for any transfer news and uh, and hope for all the best, hopefully no outgoings, which is, I guess, as you say, the most important thing at this stage. Um before we move on to the preview of the Stoke game, I, there was another bit of City news that's been floating around this week that um, I thought I'd get your comment on, which was um, the news or the teasing of the new crest, which is to come in the next couple of weeks. Um, the club put out quite a well-put-together video with um, Les, who I believe is a regular on the Amber Nectar podcast and, and is obviously uh, runs the Hull City Kits uh, account on Twitter. Um, very well put together video about the history of the club and the crest and the relationship between the crest and the, the, the supporters, um, which I think is a very accurate one. I think in a lot of ways, the kit and the crest as part of the kit um, are the things that are most identifiable as being the club because the players come and go, but the supporters, whether they you know purchase the replica kits, whatever, they'll always have those kits and have those memories of those seasons. Um, and it's a very sort of... Um, you know, strong relationship between those two aspects of the club. So um, I wanted to get your thoughts on, on the uh, potential new crest or the, the new crest that's coming and potentially what it will look like uh, and whether you have any sort of, you know, um, wishes for the crest, anything that you don't hope that you don't see on the crest, that sort of thing. I, I guess this one is, is an interesting one and I know that it's a, a hot topic amongst uh, many of the traditionalists uh, that a lot of people weren't happy with the old crest and they couldn't understand um, why it changed to, to what it changed in. And not to say that uh, all, all crests have the, I guess, the, the proper branding of the club in the crest. Some uh, of the more famous crests are just identifiable uh, purely from, from the logo. Um, I think of a club like Derby, where it's just the, the picture of the, a ram, for example. Um, but I did, I did remember that when they released the last crest, how... Um, a lot of the fans were really disappointed with the just the Tiger logo with the 1904 and no real reference to City. Uh, I guess the the fact that that dropped in conjunction with the uh, I guess the tumultuous rebrand of the or, or suggested rebrand of the name change, um, it, it was certainly at, at a time where it, uh, it evoked a, a very negative response from the City fans. So I think that. If in an ideal world, uh, a crest with with some kind of uh, referral to to Hull being a city and and having a, a city reference, that would be, uh, I think, 99% of people's viewpoints that would uh, make the crest uh, much more likable. And, do, do, and you hopefully sort of, the do you want to see an update to the tiger face? Because that's an interesting one. I've seen a lot of people say that they love that tiger head and that they they want basically, you know, as close as possible to just a return to the old crest. Whereas, personally, if I'm being quite um, quite objective or quite harsh, I guess, depending on your viewpoint, I, I'm not a huge fan of that tiger. I just don't think it looks particularly um, aggressive. And generally, for a sporting crest, you sort of want quite a fierce sort of pose or, or look to the animal. If you're going to have an animal mascot, you don't want something that looks a bit sappy and, you know, harmless. Um, and I guess that's probably influenced a bit by, for instance, the Richmond Tigers logo in the Australian Football League um, down here in Australia, or Aussie rules, um, which is a, which is a much more sort of striking tiger. Um, you know, whether it's a, a, a tiger with its fangs bared or something like that, I'd probably just want to see an update to that, um, as well as, as you say, um, 
obviously a reference to, to the club being Hull City. Yeah, I think the the Tigers an interesting one. I think that no other no other club seems to seems to be so pressed to to change their uh, their logo as much as uh, I guess in recent times we have. And I think that it's something that we've got to be very careful of. That if if the Tiger that has has been around for so long is the, is the thing that people are identifiable with and, and do relate that to City, then I think that. Changing of the tiger face isn't um, necessarily an important part, but rather uh, what accompanies it. So I'm happy with the tiger personally. I think it's it's one of those things that will probably divide opinions, but I think the most important thing is to to in some way, shape, or form get that reference to City back on the the logo, so that at least in the bare minimum um, it will appeal to the majority of fans. Fair enough. Um, well, we'll look ahead now to that Stoke City fixture this Saturday night. Um, Pretty vital fixture again, sort of like the Blackburn game, playing a side around us on the table. Um, they've picked up um, a w- pretty impressive win against Leeds um, two games ago, but then last time out lost to Preston. So new manager at the club now, um, I think is it, I think it's Nathan Jones, who they've picked up from, uh, from Luton. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how he goes with them stepping up from a League One club. Um yeah, they're League One, not League Two. Yeah, um, so that'll be an interesting one for them. Um, and of course, interesting from another perspective being that there's a couple of ex-City players in their starting eleven at the moment. Um, Josh Tymon starting the last game along with Sam Klukas. Um, interesting that, that uh, Josh has made his way into the first team for Stoke because for a while there, he was playing for the under-21s, he was getting loaned out, he was you know, not really getting a look in at senior level. Um, and so it's it's good to see that the managers come in and put a bit of faith in him and, and put him into the starting eleven. Uh, and so it'll be it'll be an interesting one if he starts against us because obviously as a Hull-born lad, um, it'll be a pretty big game for him. Yeah, certainly, and I I, I look forward to seeing the the reaction that um, the city fans uh, do give him because of the I guess the manner in which he left. Um, some people blame him, some people uh, don't blame him, but I think that the the time that he did make that decision to go to Stoke uh, wasn't wasn't necessarily the greatest time for us to be losing anybody. Um, and a, a lot of people are of the belief that, that City gave him his start and that they would have liked to have seen a little bit more uh, resolve and, uh, I guess, for a paying of the faith, uh, so to speak. But, yeah, I, I'm looking forward to seeing him play and uh, and, and see what kind of performance uh, he, he does produce against us and his old club. Uh, and do you have a score prediction for this game? Uh, I think score predictions at the moment are a very tough one. What I would like to see, um, firstly, is is us find the that flu, fluidity in in the midfield and see if we can't go back to creating uh, the opportunities that we've seen in the previous weeks before the Blackburn game. I I, if, I think if we can do that, I'm I'm suggesting a will be run out winners two one. Uh, but if if we get uh, breaking down the midfield, I think it'll probably be one 0 I can't see Stoke putting too many goals on us, but I do think that they will um, th- there will be a, a, a threat at trying to really strangle us in the midfield again. Uh, and I guess the other angle to take is what sort of changes potentially would you see to the starting 11? I guess um, clearly Mazouk's going to be out of that starting 11. I don't know if device is fit, so I suspect it would mean that sort of as we were touching on before, you'd see McKenzie at centre-back and potentially Lee High. Uh, with Kane and Kingsley as the fullbacks, um, is there any other sort of formation that you'd look at, or any other sort of rotation? I think Irvine is back now from the Asian Cup, so potentially um, adds a bit of competition for Evandro for the more attacking midfield slot. Um, whether we throw him straight back in or not uh, would be an interesting one, but at least we've got a few different options now to to sort of play around with if if we want to make any changes. Well, and that's given the given the events that are set to happen within the next 24 hours as well. Um, some of the the people in our predicted starting lineups may not be City players. <laughs> True. Um, the, the other thing, I guess, the injury cloud over uh, Bowen when he was uh, when he was hacked by uh, Jack Rodwell and and went off uh, looking rather rather sore as well. Whether he makes a return, so um, I guess you've got a, a straight swap in uh, in Pew for him. Uh, if if he is uh, unable to take the field, but yet yeah, I think the the main question marks uh, mainly I guess centre around our defence and uh, I guess from certainly from what the forums have been suggesting, uh, Chris Martin will be making way 
um, back to the bench and, and Fraser Campbell will be returning to that, that up front start. So what do you make of that? I mean, Campbell was injured for a little bit um, in January, but seems to have just uh, been back sitting on the bench um, whilst fit. Um, Adkins sort of making comments that he, he was quite confident in, in Martin leaving the line and saw Martin as quite an important cog with the um, attacking play from Bowen and Grzycki. But clearly, I would think Campbell's the more logical option up front because he can actually provide a bit more attacking um, goal threat. Um, has quite a good scoring record so far this season. So do you think it's more a case of sort of giving Campbell a bit of a breather during the middle of the season to sort of get him fresh and firing for the for the run-in? Perhaps. I, I have, as we said, I've, I've read some extremely negative uh, comments and I do think that Chris Martin has been rather poor uh, in the last couple of weeks. But that's not to say that uh, that I necessarily disagree with Atkins. I think that when Chris Martin is on the field and, and plays a 50, 60 minutes and you bring Campbell on for those final 30, I think that that's when we see the best of Fraser Campbell with that high-energy, um, harassing uh, mentality where he gives uh, the the opposition's defence something to really think about. Um, and as the, particularly as the game goes on, they, they don't want to be hassled by a, a very hungry uh, Fraser Campbell. And as he's shown, he has still got that incredible knack for goal. Um, so in that respect, I, I don't necessarily have such a huge problem with Chris Martin starting. I just think that if the, if that's the view that Chris Martin does have a role to play, then I think that that role is best served with Fraser Campbell um, partnering him in, in the second half of the game and, and Martin making way so that Campbell can go on and, and do his thing and really... Um, look to kind of set out that, that last third of the game. Well, it'll be interesting to see how we line up and uh, whether any potentially new signings are part of that 11 on the weekend against Stokes. It'll be a good game to look forward to and, and hopefully a return to winning ways for the team. But um, until then, I'll say thank you for joining me, Logan. And not a problem. And thank you, everyone, for listening in. Hopefully we can get the three points and start surging back up the table. But until next week, come on, City. You've been listening to the official Hull City Australia podcast. For more discussion, join us on Facebook in the Hull City AFC Australian Supporters Group or follow us on Twitter at Hull City AFC Oz. The music was created by Amber and Black.